harvesting sites, and this is Prairie du Sac, Wisconsin here. If we look from the river um, from uh, Sauk Prairie on the northern end, or from Sauk Prairie on the northern end, all the way down to the village of Lone Rock, which is just right off the screen, just about in here, about 35 miles of river, most of the eagles can be located upriver at the dam when it's cold and blustery like it is today. But if it's warm and the river is open and free of ice, the eagles can be located downriver and not so much in the upriver area. So the dam becomes important, but only when the conditions are such that the eagles are forced into the upriver area um, because a lot of the river is unavailable to them. So if we look at that from a graphic point of view, these are eagle numbers in downriver roosts that you saw on the previous slide. Those eagle numbers are high when the ice, denoted by the yellow histograms, when the ice is low. But as that ice builds up, eagle numbers in the downriver roosts decline. But if you look upriver, it's when the ice is abundant downriver that eagle numbers increase. And so basically the eagles are responding to that um, ice cover by moving to where they can find food. These mobile eagles then are very adaptive to their uh, winter areas and they'll shift around and find the place where they can find the most food and utilize that area. Now, one of the reasons why I'm talking about this is if we go to the slides, we've tried to incorporate that behavior of eagles, the winter behavior of eagles, into helping you um, find where you can go to see eagles during the winter. So we're mixing human behavior with eagle behavior. And so if you go to our website at ferry, uh, www.ferrybluffeaglecouncil.org, you can see um, on this that there's a place where there is a self-guided tour. And so the self-guided tour is that um, uh, third uh, little icon at the bottom of the thing, and you can go to the self-guided tour. And when you go to that, you'll find uh, a choice to go to an upriver tour or a downriver tour. So this is the example of the upriver tour, and it tells you places on the Wisconsin River where you can go to watch eagles from uh, Sauk City, Wisconsin, at the lower part of the map here, all the way up to the dam north of Prairie du Sac, and it gives you ideas of where you can see eagles in that area if eagles are concentrated upriver. You can also then go downriver if that's where you're expected to find the birds. So from Sauk City all the way down towards uh, Spring Green, Wisconsin, you can see places where you're going downriver. Now, we don't expect you to know for sure where the eagles are, so the final part of this is we provide you with some information about the eagle distribution at any given time on the Wisconsin River. So again, on our website, if you go to the icon of uh, eagle locations, you'll find where our eagles are most likely to be. So from our count on January 17, most of the eagles were downriver. 55 out of the 60 eagles that we counted were downriver. And upriver, there are only two. So on January 17, most of the eagles were downriver. And you would want to use the downriver um, tour to uh, have your best chance of seeing eagles. I would expect with this cold weather and the snow that's forecasted to come tonight, these birds are going to shift upriver. So by next week, you're, wanting, you're going to want to be using the upriver tours uh, in our area. So we're combining what we know about eagle ecology of the birds with trying to give you advice on where to go. And if you're in these um, areas looking for eagles, we hope that you're going to um, visit some of our supporters and some of the businesses in the area, whether that be in Prairie du Sac, Sauk City, Mazomany, Arena, Spring Green, or Lone Rock. The whole landscape that is both eagle habitat and humid habitat. But we hope that the uh, tours will help you be able to do that in a safe, productive manner. So, with that, I'd like to segue then into the first of our presentations by Schlitz Audubon Nature Center. And we're going to be doing that in two ways. We'll have a pre-recorded video where Schlitz gives us a 
behind the scenes tour of how they go about caring for these wonderful birds that they um, are responsible for. And then we'll have a live Birds of Prey show. And during that live Birds of Prey show, you'll have a couple of periods of time where we can ask, or you can ask some questions and receive answers from the staff from Schlitz Audubon. So to ask the questions, please make sure that you uh, provide us a chat with us on YouTube or on Facebook. And if you can, provide your first name and location so that we can identify who's uh, asking the question. Before we move over to Schlitz, we'll see a little spot um, supporting, uh, that talks about supporting the endangered resources um, funds that keep eagles going, which once were on that endangered list, and a whole lot of other species that still are on that list, and how you can participate in supporting our endangered resources in Wisconsin. The eagle has landed. Get your one-of-a-kind endangered resources license plate today and help care for Wisconsin's wildlife and state natural areas. Hello from the Schlitz Audubon Nature Center Raptor Team. We are so excited to be coming to you virtually this year for Bald Eagle Watching Days. Here at Schlitz Audubon, we have two bald eagles that live with us and work as educational ambassadors for their species. As with all the raptors that live here at Schlitz Audubon, they both have specific reasons that they are non-releasable to the wild and would not be able to survive without human care. Here with us, they are given the highest quality of care and help teach the public all about their species, both their amazing adaptations, as well as the threats currently facing the wild populations. In this video, we will take a look behind the scenes to see what a day in the life is like for an educational ambassador bald eagle at Schlitz Audubon Nature Center. First, let's meet our two eagles so we can learn more about how they came to live with us. This is Glory, our 19-year-old male bald eagle. Um, he has lived with us ever since he was young, less than a year old. He came to us with a brown head and brown tail, and we've had the pleasure of watching him grow into an adult feathered ambassador ever since. Now, he did hatch in the wild in Prairie du Sac, Wisconsin, uh, so he is local. And unfortunately, when he was a young bird learning how to fly, he crash landed out of his nest. Um, he did break some bones in his wings that would be analogous to our fingers. And he was brought to a wildlife rehabilitation center. Uh, there they were able to fix his bones. They are no longer broken or in pain. Uh, but unfortunately, he was so young at the time uh, that he spent too much time around people and began to associate himself in our presence instead of other eagles. We call this imprinting on humans. And it means that Glory does not have the skills necessary to hunt or survive for himself. Uh, he has lived with us ever since, and bald eagles can live to be 50 years old in captivity. So we hope that he has a long life left with us. This here is Valkyrie. Valkyrie is a nine-year-old female adult bald eagle. Just like Glory, she came to live with us here at Schlitz Audubon when she was a very young eagle. She is larger than Glory, which is typical of female raptors. They are larger than their male counterparts. Valkyrie weighs about 11 pounds and has a six foot wingspan. When she came to live with us here at Schlitz, she was about this size, but did not have that magnificent white head or tail yet. Valkyrie did hatch out in the wild but she was left by her parents earlier than normal before they were able to teach her how to hunt on her own. She did find herself nearby some local fishermen who had the best intentions, but were feeding her some free fish. When the fishermen left for the season, Valkyrie no longer had a food source. So she sought out other humans, such as campers and picnickers, and asked them for some free scraps of food instead. As you can imagine, this is very dangerous, not only for Valkyrie, but for the humans as well. 
The DNR stepped in and worked with a wildlife rehabilitation center and deemed that Valkyrie could not unlearn that humans equals a food source. So she could not be re-released out into the wild. This process is called habituation and Valkyrie is habituated to people, meaning that she associates us with a food source since she cannot hunt on her own. Valkyrie is one of our most vocal birds and at programs she lets out that beautiful bald eagle cackle and captures any room that she is a part of. Now that you guys know a little bit more about Valkyrie and Glory, we hope that you enjoy a behind the scenes look at their life here with us at Schlitz Audubon. An important part of our raptor's health is a clean enclosure. Each of our birds have their own indoor and outdoor enclosures called a mew that's specifically designed for a bird of their size. These mews give each bird enough room for them to fly around freely, perch on a variety of perches, take a bath, and a space for them to hunker down for the night and rest. A few days each week, they will leave their enclosure and wait for their personal cleaning crew to come in and make their muse brand new. Schlitz Audubon relies on a team of nearly 45 wonderful volunteers who dedicate their time to taking care of our feathered ambassadors. This diligent team ensures that Valkyrie and Glory have a clean space to live in with fresh water and fresh enrichment. When their mews are cleaned, a staff member will retrieve Valkyrie or Glory from their mew by asking them to step up to their glove. They will then attach a leash to their jesses and tie the leash into their glove to ensure the bird is safely with its handler when they leave the space. To ensure that they're healthy throughout the year, we regularly weigh all of our birds as weight fluctuation is a big indicator in birds of underlying health concerns. All the birds have been trained to step voluntarily to a scale where their handler can check their weight. Their weights are then recorded so that we can compare weights between seasons and years. Staff will also regularly check their feet, beaks, and equipment. As you can see here, Valkyrie has been trained to perch on this see-through station so staff members can easily see underneath her feet to ensure that there are no sores or breakages. After Valkyrie has been weighed and her feet checked, she will move into her travel crate to wait for her mew to be cleaned. These crates are also what our birds travel in to all educational programs. They have all been trained to see the crate as a safe space where they can sit calmly in a tarp, quiet place. When their mews are all fresh and clean, staff will ask the eagle to come out of the crate, walk them back to their mew, and take off their equipment where they can then return freely to move about their mews as they please. After their mew is cleaned, our birds get fed their first meal of the day. Valkyrie and Glory are each fed two meals each day. The exact amount of food per day depends on their current weight and the time of year. As wild animals' metabolisms change depending on the temperature and amount of sunlight. Bald eagles are native to Wisconsin all year round, so our eagles have outdoor spaces that are subject to the seasons just like wild bald eagles are. Winter in Wisconsin can get pretty cold, so we feed our eagles more than they would get during the summertime, so that that extra weight can keep them nice and warm. The eagles get a variety of menu items, such as rats, quail, rabbits, and fish, as those animals are regular food items in the diet of a wild eagle. Glory's favorite thing to do is fish his meal right out of his water, which simulates the natural behavior of fishing that bald eagles are so well adapted to. Part of cleaning mews means offering new enrichment items, 
which is an essential part of animal welfare. Animal enrichment can be anything that challenges the mind or encourages different behaviors from day to day. It could be a toy item, a training session, or new sounds that they have never heard before. Giving our birds new enrichment allows them to exhibit their species typical behavior, as we saw when Glory was fishing for his meal. These exercises give them the opportunity to exercise control and choice over their environment while keeping their minds active. Our volunteers and staff are constantly coming up with new ideas for how to enrich our birds. We keep a large variety of enrichment items, including different sized kongs, balls, and decoy animals such as ducks and snakes. Here, staff brought Glory outside of the raptor facility for a walk to enjoy new textures on his feet sounds of birds and other wildlife, and new sights to enrich his mind. As educational ambassadors, Valkyrie and Glory's most important job is to go to a variety of different programs to help educate the public of all ages about Paul the Eagle's natural history, the importance of raptors to the environment, and the threats currently facing their species. The eagles will be retrieved from their mew, stepped into their crate, and then loaded carefully into our raptor equipped van before driving off to whatever program they are attending that day. Valkyrie and Glory have been to many different programs over the past few years. From schools, to museums, and even to the Wisconsin State Fair. And of course, they make an appearance every year at Bald Eagle Watching Days. This year has looked a little different for all of us, including the Schlitz Audubon Eagles. They have had a year of doing many virtual programs, both live and pre-recorded. The crowds they see are much different than in years past and often look much smaller and are spread out instead of the packed gymnasiums and auditoriums that they are used to. After a long day of cleaning, eating, traveling, and educating the public, Valkyrie and Glory are left to enjoy their own space. With the proper care, bald eagles can live up to 50 years in captivity. Valkyrie and Glory have many more years of educating the public about our country's national symbol. Thank you for your continued support and for joining us in this behind the scenes look at the day of a life of a bald eagle at Schlitz Audubon Nature Center. We hope to see you all again in person next year at Bald Eagle Watching Days. Hi, Liz. I'd like to, for our audience, introduce you, Liz um, Alanya, to um, our Bald Eagle Watching Days, and we will meet Ian Dorney in a little bit, as I understand it. And so thank you for uh, joining us, first of all, and even foremost of all. And thanks also, of course, to your stars of the show, which at least your feathered stars. Um, and before we um, um, get started with your, your program, we had a question from Justin on Richland Center, and he was just curious about where the name Valkyrie came from. And since that was you holding Valkyrie, you'd be the perfect person to answer. Uh, yes, so Valkyrie, um, her name comes from a, um, oh, I am blanking where Valkyrie name comes from. So this already is starting off well. Maybe we can switch to Ian and Ian can tell us a little bit about Valkyrie's name. Yes, Valkyrie was named, um, Valkyrie was named <clears throat> after the, uh, the Norse mythological characters, the Valkyries who would fly over um, the battlefield and take fallen warriors to Valhalla. That's my understanding, um, although that is, I'm not super studied up on my ancient North mythology, Norse mythology. 
Um, but because she is a, a bold, powerful um, figure, and obviously eagles have meant a lot to people around the world for thousands of years, um, we felt that that both fit her personality. Um, it was just a, a fun, fun little story to talk about, you know, other winged characters with strong personalities. So. Well, and that's really uh, kind of fun because, um, of course, in, in Norway, um, it's the white-tailed sea eagle that uh, is abundant there. And uh, our bald eagle is a close relative, but they're a little bit different from each other. And since many of the original Europeans to come to the Midwest were Norwegians, we have our, our human equivalent of Americans of Norwegian descent. And we also have the bald eagle, which is essentially a good cousin of the white-tailed sea eagle. So I like that mixture of uh, uh, stories about this. Um, well, we are very happy to have you here um, for Eagle Days. And I think our audience would love to know more about um, these birds of prey. And I'll let you, without further ado, take the show away. Great. Thank you, Jeb. So yes, hello everyone from us here at Schlitz Audubon Nature Center. Um, we're very happy to be here for a virtual raptor live stream for Bald Eagle Watching Days 2021. My name is Liz and I am a raptor educator and I'm joined today with my coworker Ian as well as of course a few of our feathered coworkers to meet you guys as well. If you have not heard of us at Schlitz Audubon, we are a nature center located on the north side of Milwaukee. So if you have not visited us before, I do highly recommend it. We are a little pocket of nature in that urban Milwaukee setting. We have 185 acres of woodlands and restored prairie, and we even have a half mile stretch of beachfront right along Lake Michigan. So in total, we have about six miles of hiking trails to explore and even a 60 foot lookout tower that guests can enjoy year round to look at that beautiful expanse of um, Lake Michigan. The Schlitz Audubon Raptor Program has had the pleasure of attending Bald Eagle Watching Days since 2016. And we are very happy to be invited back this year, um, despite it being in a different capacity but we are definitely looking forward to sharing a few of our ambassador birds with you guys and getting a chance to celebrate these beautiful animals while talking about nature and conservation over this next hour. At Schlitz, we have many ambassador animals that live here to teach the public all about their species. We have snakes, we have turtles, and even tarantulas as well. But of course, today we are here to talk about birds, specifically birds of prey. We have 15 non-releasable birds of prey that live here with us at Schlitz, meaning that they all have certain reasons that they cannot be released into the wild and it depend on human care for survival. So let me share my points. Perfect. So most of the birds in our program are part of the raptor family and the raptor family shares specific adaptations. An adaptation is a tool that helps an animal survive out in the wild. And raptors, so these adaptations can either be a physical adaptation, so a part of an animal's body or a behavioral adaptation, which is an action that animal takes. Raptors specifically share three physical adaptations. Raptors have strong, sharp talons. These are basically their hunting tools. So they use these talons to grab onto their prey. Raptors also have a hooked and curved upper beak. This acts as their fork and knife. So they can break their prey into more manageable small pieces. And raptors have incredible eyesight and eyes that face forward in their skulls. Talons, hooked beak, forward facing eyes. When we think of raptors, we are thinking of predatory birds such as hawks, owls, eagles, and falcons. 
these raptors are very well equipped with some amazing adaptations that help them be the apex predators of the sky, but they still do face multiple threats for their survival in Wisconsin, which we will be exploring today as we learn each about each of these species and kind of their natural history as well. So with that introduction, I will pass the torch over to Ian. Um, and like I said, throughout the program, Jeb will be bringing us some questions and there's multiple times where you can answer questions throughout. But go ahead, Ian, I will pass it over to you now. All right, thank you, Liz. Of the five birds that we will be meeting today, our first is a classic example of a raptor. This is a hawk, more specifically a red-shouldered hawk. Now, for those of you who have not seen a red-shouldered hawk before, um, it is no wonder, especially if you've attended programs from Schlitz Audubon before, this individual bird is new to our program. She joined last February, um, and because of a normal quarantine for birds joining our program, and then a training period, and then obviously the human quarantines happening, Atlas hasn't had a whole lot of exposure to the public. So we're very excited to be bringing her out to y'all today. Now, this red-shouldered hawk, like the rest of the raptors, has strong talons. I don't want to bring her too close to the laptop just so that she doesn't get nervous. But on her feet, which are yellow, you may be able to see those black talons that she is gripping my glove with. When Atlas who is very, very interested in the snowshoes across the room from me. Uh, when Atlas would be grabbing her food, she uses those talons to pierce the skin and hold onto her food. And then her toes as a hawk are well adapted to crush her food and cause its death that way. Moving up her body, she has those other two classic raptor adaptations, that sharp hooked beak on her face. After she crushes her food to death, she uses that hooked beak to tear her food into bite-sized pieces. Now, raptors tend to hunt food that fits in their feet. Her toes and talons are able to comfortably wrap around something the size of a golf ball. So in the wild, red-shouldered hawks are going after predominantly mammals, but occasionally other creatures in their habitat that are squirrel-sized and smaller. Obviously swallowing a whole squirrel at once is difficult. So that hooked beak comes in handy when she's tidbitting it into small pieces for herself. And then as she's showing off right now, looking above the camera, <clears throat> Atlas has those two forward facing eyes that all raptors have. And many predators have these in the animal kingdom. Humans are one of them. So if you compare my face to hers, when we look directly above the camera, you'll be able to see both of our eyes at a single time. Now, if you compared that to a goat, a rabbit, or a horse, generally herbivorous animals, generally prey animals that have to worry about predators coming around. Prey animals have eyes on the side of their face to help see the world around them. But predators like humans, cats, dogs, and raptors have these forward-facing eyes to help us focus on one object at a time. And Atlas, having never been in this room before, is focusing very intently on one thing at a time and making sure that they aren't food or a threat to her safety. Now, in addition to her three physical raptor adaptations, red-shouldered hawks have their own flair, their own adaptations to help them survive. The most notable and striking about a red-shouldered hawk is their coloration. So on her chest and across her shoulders, if she were to open her wings, she has these beautiful dappled red patches that fill her belly and stretch all the way to the wrists on her wings. And that's where the red-shouldered hawk gets their name. But if I slowly turn her around, you will see that the rest of her body stands in direct contrast to the red shoulders. The ends of her wings and the tail are banded and checkered black and white. 
which makes for a very memorable composition of color. Red-shouldered hawks use this coloration to their advantage because they are forest hunters. <clears throat> if you have the opportunity to see a red-shouldered hawk in the wild, they're most often found nesting in old growth forests, about 60 feet off the ground, so really big old trees. And they're hunting around swamps and marshes, looking for either amphibians or mammals to get their talons on. And as a hawk, most of their hunting is either soaring above the canopy or sitting in the canopy of, the, of those trees. And having this cryptic coloration, this dappling of different colors helps her blend in and protect herself when she's in the trees or on the ground eating her meal. <clears throat> now, Unfortunately, raptor adaptations, those talons, those beaks, those forward-facing eyes, and red-shouldered hawk adaptations, that uh, cryptic coloration she has, can't protect her from everything. This individual red-shouldered hawk, Atlas, uh, was injured as an adult. So she lives with us because of a permanent wing injury due to a car collision. So seven years ago, Atlas was flying around her habitat, some old growth forest or a marsh, and she flew across a road and was struck by a car. That caused permanent damage in her left wing, so this one over here, and she is fully non-flighted. So while we would love to give her a space for, uh, for flying around, she unfortunately cannot fly in the wild or even in captivity without causing harm to herself. <clears throat> she originally was in captivity in Colorado at a facility called Nature's Educators. Um, but they heard that we were looking for a medium-sized hawk like her. So they transferred her to us, as we said, last February. And now that she's in Wisconsin, she helps educate audiences about the need for wetland conservation. In Wisconsin, the red-shouldered hawk is not super um, common. Um, and for Nick, who I believe is facilitating, I would love to be able to share my screen so that I can show us some range maps of these birds in Wisconsin. But they're most easily found around those old growth forests or those wetlands because that's either good nesting habitat or good habitat for them to hunt for their food. Uh, recent Wisconsin DNR estimates place them at a few hundred birds in Wisconsin in a threatened status because their habitat is slowly disappearing. In the last century, over 50% of Wisconsin's wetlands have been uh, turned into different land uses like crops, roads and cities, and not just red-shouldered hawks, but 75% of animals in Wisconsin rely on wetlands through their life. So while red-shouldered hawks are prevalent across the U.S. with a, a lot of concentrations on the west coast and in the south, in Wisconsin they are not as numerous. These are some of the known nesting sites where these birds have been observed. <clears throat> and if you know anything about Wisconsin topography, you'll recognize some patterns, especially in the southeast of the state. Those are riparian areas, so rivers and ponds with lots of old growth trees. Once again, about half of Wisconsin wetlands have been converted to different land uses, and that is a direct threat to red-shouldered hawks. But 75% of the critters that live in our state depend on wetlands at some point. We're thinking about the frogs, we're thinking of salamanders, some of our reptiles, the predators, the moose, the deer, the raccoons. So when we protect the habitat of red-shouldered hawks, we are protecting 75% of Wisconsin's wildlife. Now at this time, if there are questions about red-shouldered hawks or about Atlas in particular, I would love to answer one or two of them. And I will, as we take those questions, um, try to keep her on screen here.
Ian, we've got some uh, uh, fun questions. I think Miranda from New Haven, Connecticut, she's interested in understanding more about why you would quarantine Atlas before when she was just being introduced to your program. Yeah, that is a fantastic question. Now, <clears throat> the reason that we quarantine new birds when they join our program is because these birds have their own biome, their own set of creatures that live in their body. In the same way that human bodies have different sets of bacteria and yes, unfortunately, parasites, these birds can carry diseases with them. They can carry feather parasites. <clears throat> and when they're transferred between facilities or if they're a wild bird brought into a rehab, we do our best to keep those birds away from each other until we have confirmation that they're not going to make the rest of the collection or the rest of the animals in the rehab sick. So that quarantine was short. It was about a week, maybe two weeks before we got confirmation from our vet that everything was okay. And then a few months after her quarantine ended, she was ready to do programs in our summer camps. That was a great question. We'll take one more. Um, Patty was interested if, if you could compare um, red-shouldered hawks with red-tailed hawks in terms of size and uh, that sort of thing, because of course the red-shouldered hawk looks a little bit like a red-tailed hawk. It helps if I unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you, Patty, for that question. Red-shouldered hawks have a few key differences that can help you identify them from red tails. If you find these birds in flight, red-shouldered hawks are going to have a much more ruddy chest. And you may be able to see those wrists, but the key for identifying these birds in flight is to look at their wing tips. Red-shouldered hawk wing tips because of this beautiful checkering that they have on their body, they look like they have translucent window panes through their feathers. Whereas a red-tailed hawk is going to have pretty much a solid cream wing. You'll be able to see the banding and the translucent white windows on a red-shouldered hawk. <clears throat> if you find them in the wild um, and perched, the red-tailed hawk, obviously there's a lot of color variation that can happen. My biggest identifying clue is where I am. As we mentioned, red-shouldered hawks like Atlas here prefer old growth forests and wetlands. And they're not shy about flying through the trees if they have to. Whereas red-tailed hawks prefer big open country so if you're not able to see the exact markings of, ooh, does it have a red tail or a banded black and white tail? You can look where you are. And if it is a large bird um, <clears throat> and it is perched up on a light post in a big open area around a, a field, that's likely a red tailed. Or if you're in a forest or around a river or swamp, you may be looking at a red shouldered. I will say in many cases, it is going to be a red-tailed hawk because red-tailed hawks, um, their range has been expanding, whereas red-shouldered hawks are becoming more and more rare to see in Wisconsin. So in order to clearly identify a red shoulder versus a red tail, um, that coloration is gonna be really important. But in most cases in Wisconsin that you probably are looking at a red-tailed hawk. <clears throat> Thank you for those questions. Continue to put them into chat. We would love to answer them about our individual birds, but we have a busy afternoon ahead of us. So I'm going to hand it over to Liz and she's going to introduce us to our next bird. All right. Thank you, Ian. So this bird here is another bird that relies on those wetland habitats, like we were talking about with Atlas. This here is Perseus, and Perseus is a barred owl. So that is B-A-R-R-E-D, the barred owl, named after that barring on his chest. So barred owls also live in the wetlands. They also eat all of those slippery, slimy creatures like salamanders, toads, uh, snakes, all that fun stuff. But red-shouldered hawks 
and barred owls are able to coexist in the same habitats because red-shouldered hawks <laughs> red-shouldered hawks hunt during the day they are diurnal and barred owls hunt at night they are nocturnal so they are able to coexist together in those wetland habitats so Perseus has those same rapture adaptations that we have been talking about. He has those sharp talons, that hooked beak, as well as those forward facing eyes. But since Perseus is an owl and they are nocturnal, they have even more specialized adaptations since they are hunting at the darkest points of the night. So one of the first things I notice when I look at Percy is how huge his eyes are. And those eyes are certainly big. Us as humans, our eyes only take up about 5% of the space in our skull, but owls take up 75% of the space in their skull. So they are quite large. Those eyes also have more rod cells than cone cells allowing them to see in very dim light and allowing them to let as much light in as possible. So those eyes are also so big that there isn't any room for the muscles around the eyes to move them in the skull. So barred owl's eyes are fixed in place, always looking forward. The solution to this, of course, is a very flexible neck as Perseus is showing off as he looks all around this room. Percy has definitely been in this room before, but he has to search around to make sure there's no funny business going on and look around all around him for any um, predators or prey as well. Surrounding those incredibly special eyes is this distinctive rounding of feathers, giving owls that very round looking at face. So they have a stiff ring of feathers around their eyes, and that is called a facial disc. And that facial disc acts pretty much like a big satellite. We can't see the eyes or the, the ears on Perseus, but those ears are located at the edge of that facial disc. And that facial disc allows sounds to be funneled into those ears, which also helps them hunting at night they can hear that pitter patter of little mice feet all the way up from whatever tree they are perched in. If those mice are scrambling underneath the leaves or even underneath the snow because barred owls are non-migratory and they stay in Wisconsin year round, they will certainly be able to pinpoint where that mouse is, where that salamander is, whatever they're going after and be able to pounce down on it. Oh, oh, oh. And the best part of all of this is that the um, prey will not even hear the barred owl coming because barred owls have silent flight, as owls do. Owls have incredibly soft feathers, as well as fringes on the leaving and trailing edges of their wings that look kind of like little eyelash fringes. And these help muffle the sound of the wind as it passes through the wing. The wing giving them silent flight, truly making them a sneaky predator of the night. Now, Perseus came to live with us here at Schlitz because he had an, an, an unfortunate run-in with humans when he was a very young owlet. So Perseus fell from his nest when he was a very young owl, likely trying to learn how to fly. Unfortunately, that nest was located in a very busy park so little fuzzy Perseus was on the ground in this park and people began coming up to him and petting him and picking him up and interacting with him. And his mother owl ended up fleeing the nesting location and leaving Perseus behind because of course owls view us as very large predators and that would be quite scary for her and her young. So she had to flee at the nest and leave Perseus behind. This left Perseus alone, scared, dehydrated, and it took a while for wildlife rehabilitators to step in. And by the time they stepped in, Perseus had spent too much time in that presence of humans 
and he began associating himself in our presence rather than his own species. This is a process called imprinting, and it is a permanent condition. So Perseus will not be able to be re-released out into the wild because he did not get to that time to learn how to be an owl out in the wild. So thankfully, thankfully, barred owls are not on that state threatened or endangered species list like the red-shouldered hawk is but they do face some conservation concerns of their own. Barred owls are cavity nesters. As we can see from this wonderful picture of these cute barred owls in their tree. So barred owls search for dead trees and a nice hole in there to build their nest. And unfortunately, many times us as humans, tend, we tend to cut down these dead trees. What we don't realize is that dead trees are still absolutely filled of life. And many animals, not just barred owls, use these holes in these dead trees as safety areas, as their nesting locations. And of course, whoop, through a lot, there we are. <laughs> And of course, barred owls live in wetland areas. As we have talked about, these are shrinking areas in our state. So wetlands, we encourage you guys to go out, see wetlands, learn about how important these wetlands are for um, many different animals and how cool these areas are. You can do stuff in your own life to protect wetlands, such as volunteering to help clean up these wetlands and also reducing your use of pesticides, fertilizers, anything like that that can seep into the groundwater. And another conservation concern for barred owls for many predatory birds is rodenticides or rat poisons. So these rat poisons, homeowners and business owners put out in attempts to free their property of pest species what we don't realize is that sometimes these rat poisons can take up to a week to do the job. So a rat can be running around with that poison in its system up to a week before it actually kills the rat. That essentially makes these rats and mice ticking time bombs for predatory birds such as owls. So we encourage all of our homeowners and business owners to look into non-toxic forms of pest control because there really is no such thing as a safe rat poison. And I will certainly take any questions, Jeb, if we have any about Perseus or barred owls. Liz, um, Brian was interested to know more about the jesses or the leather um, ankle bracelets that you use on the raptors. Yes, so when our, uh, any of our raptors are at a program, they have a leash that attaches to those jesses that then attaches to our glove. That keeps the birds safe with us if they are not familiar in a space. And um, even though Perseus knows this area, I wanna keep him safe with me. But after the program, I take that leash off, unclip it from his jesses, and he will always have the um, leather anklets around his ankles. They're basically like little bracelets with the jesses attached, but the rest of the equipment does come off. Um, and Marie was also wondering, what's the most common owl in Wisconsin? So barred owls are very common, but the most common owl in Wisconsin would be the great horned owl. But great horned owls, barred owls, and screech owls are three very common owls in our state. Well, and I think, um, I think people would want to thank um, Perseus from giving us a great demonstration of barred owl calling. Of course, he always makes sure to um, add that in as well. <laughs> All right, I will pass back off to Ian then, with our next bird. All right, thank you, Liz. Coming into frame here, I'm gonna stand her back a little bit so we can get her whole body. <clears throat> this is a very, very different type of bird of prey. Um, while owls have an awesome sense of hearing and sense of sight, 
not every bird of prey can have all five senses extremely heightened and owls actually have no sense of smell that we can measure. But this bird on my glove here has perhaps one of the best senses of smell in the animal kingdom, certainly of the birds in our collection. This is a turkey vulture. This individual is named Tallulah, but Tallulah shows off a different variation of those physical adaptations of raptors. Now she does have talons, she does have a hooked beak, and she does technically have forward facing eyes, but what makes her special is her nose. So very slowly and carefully, just so that we don't alarm her, I will try to move her a bit closer to the screen here. And you'll be able to see her nostrils. Now those nostrils are humongous compared to those of an owl. And unlike humans and owls and many other animals, her nostrils connect in the middle. She has no septum or piece of flesh between them. And this perforated or complete nostril allows her to smell food from up to a mile away. Now being able to smell so well means that turkey vultures can hunt things and hunt in ways that other birds of prey can't. And we have here a big stretch. Oh, life is hard when you have to sit in a crate for 20 minutes. All right, so turkey vultures like Tallulah can smell their prey from over a mile away if the wind is right. And that allows them to hunt carrion or dead animals like roadkill or animals that die of natural causes. <clears throat> they do prefer to eat freshly dead meat because who, who really likes rotting meat? But sometimes turkey vultures have to wait for other scavengers to come to that roadkill or carrion or carcass first. You see her feet are not exceptionally strong. Unlike Atlas, our red-shouldered hawk, and Perseus, our barred owl, Tallulah's feet are not adapted to grip and kill her food because her food's already dead. Having very flat and weak feet helps her move around on the ground quickly as she's rooting through a carcass, but <clears throat> she may have to use her beak or wait for a coyote or an eagle or a crow to open up her food so that she can get at it. Now, turkey vultures, because they're eating rotting food, have to be very resilient. If you and I were to eat food like Tulula was, to eat it after it has died and hasn't been cooked and has been sitting out for a couple days, humans and many animals would get very, very sick. But turkey vultures, despite not having that classic power of a raptor, have a hidden power. Her stomach compared to a human is 10 to 100 times better than ours. You see, when turkey vultures are rooting around in carcasses, they might run into things like botulism or anthrax, cholera, and rabies, and they have to be able to still eat without getting sick. So having stomach acids that are 10 to 100 times stronger than ours actually allows them to disinfect or sanitize their food in their stomach before this bird digests. That means as they move around Wisconsin, vultures are finding leftover meals and roadkill and they're cleaning out all the illnesses that could affect other animals, including humans. It is as if they are nature's feathered sanitation workers moving around and cleaning up what no other creature wants to. Now turkey vulture acid or their stomach acid is extremely powerful, but it isn't powerful enough to protect them from every ingestible thing. <clears throat> Sometimes when scavengers are moving around, they run into trouble. And the best example of this actually comes from a distant cousin to our turkey vulture, um, there are a couple species of vultures in India that ran into trouble themselves. <clears throat> um, a number of years ago, three species of Indian vultures entered a fast decline in numbers because of a veterinary drug called di 
diclofenac. And diclofenac was used on feverish and sick cattle to hopefully save those animals for human use. But if a, a cow died with diclofenac in its system, it would be discarded and then eaten by vultures and it caused vultures to die extremely quickly. <clears throat> Although the drug was intended for cattle, it entered the food chain of these birds and they struggled. Now this drug was banned in 2006, but 15 years later, the three species of vultures in India are still recovering from this one accidental period of poisoning. Now our turkey vultures or our type of vulture here in Wisconsin, the turkey vulture is stable. Uh, we don't use diclofenac in Wisconsin um, and we have plenty of vultures, although they have flown south for the winter. But similar to barred owls, pesticides and toxins hurt vultures as much as they do in the entire animal community. Whether we like it or not, whatever is put into the animal communities around us, vultures are one of the final recipients. So finding alternatives to pesticides and poisons protects all animals, but it protects our scavengers as well. Now, Tallulah here is, she on January 1st turned 19. Uh, we don't know exactly when she was hatched, but we decided to celebrate all of our birds' birthdays on January 1st. So as a 19-year-old bird, she is roughly middle-aged for a captive turkey vulture. In the wild, there aren't a whole lot of things that hunt adult turkey vultures. So living to 20 would be healthy and expected for a wild bird. In captivity, we hope to almost double our bird's lifespans. Um, there is a captive turkey vulture in the Raptor Center in St. Paul that is, I believe, over 50 years old this year. Um, so Tallulah will be with, a, with us a long time. And similar to Perseus, she is an imprinted bird. So she was raised around humans and didn't learn the proper social cues and hunting or scavenging, in her case, strategies to survive in the wild. And because she is physically fine, but only has that behavioral permanent imprinting, we hope that she will be around for this program and many more in years to come. So at this time, Jeb, do we have any questions about Tallulah or about turkey vultures? Oh, we have questions. Um, oh, good. You guys are doing a great job and people are quite interested in what you are presenting and in what the birds are presenting. Um, Bob, he's interested in whether or not turkey vultures and eagles would share a meal at a carcass. Mm, that is a fantastic question. <clears throat> I myself have seen trail camera footage um, that points to yes, eagles and vultures will share carcasses. Now in general, turkey vultures, because they have such a fantastic sense of smell, are going to be the first to a carcass. Um, although eagles, vultures, coyotes, raccoons, all sorts of animals can learn that perhaps a gunshot or a car driving away means there is a scavenging opportunity. In most cases, unless there is a lot to share, the turkey vultures know that they are better at finding food and they will simply leave when another animal comes to join the party, as it were. Uh, but I have seen footage of turkey vultures and eagles keeping a respectful and watchful distance as they eat from the same deer carcass. Um, <clears throat> even if they're not sharing at the same time, both turkey vultures and eagles will take any opportunity they can for free food. Um, so if you don't see them together at the same time around a roadkill, if you stick around, you will eventually see both. Last week, we talked a lot about uh, lead poisoning with eagles, and um, uh, Dawn had a question about how lead might affect turkey vultures, especially with the high acid content in their stomach. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I'm glad that we've considered that crisis um, already as an audience, many of us. 
Turkey vultures, like eagles, are affected by lead poisoning. <clears throat> but the fact of the matter is turkey vultures don't have the same societal value. We don't care as much about turkey vultures because they're not our national bird and they've been perceived and depicted as dirty and um, <clears throat> perhaps a little gross because they are solely scavengers. Um, so while lead and many other toxins through the years have affected turkey vulture populations, humans frankly have cared less about how turkey vultures are affected, so we don't track as much data. And turkey vultures are prolific. We um, don't have a problem with too many turkey vultures in Wisconsin. So because they're not um, immediately being threatened um, in terms of keeping a stable breeding population, there isn't a whole lot of data um, surrounding the numbers of turkey vultures being poisoned by lead every year. Their stomach acid content, while it is fantastic at killing biological life, like cholera and botulism and other things like that, cannot do anything to protect a turkey vulture from a abiotic or non-living toxin like lead. So if you do notice a turkey vulture, a coyote, a crow, an eagle, any scavenger that is acting strange, it may be lead poisoned. And we can help those animals quickly if we get them into a vet. Um, so they do face the same threat um, <clears throat> and they still need our help, even if society at large might not think that vultures are the bee's knees, as it were. All right, I'm going to put Tallulah back into her crate and then she'll go into free loft at the end of our program when she gets back home. Thank you for your questions. Continue to throw them into chat. Um, we'll have some time at the end as well, hopefully for more questions, but I'm going to hand you off to Liz. Wonderful. Thank you, Ian. So joining us now is another bird that has a very special relationship with humans but one that is not an accidental imprint, such as Perseus or Tallulah, we have met thus far. This here is Cutright, and Cutright is a peregrine falcon. And Cutright used to be a falconry bird. So falconry is one of the oldest, um, oldest sports in the world where a hunter works alongside a trained bird of prey to hunt wild game. So Cutright worked as a falconry bird for about 12 years before he retired due to um, developing cataracts in his eyes, which impaired his vision. So he no longer has the vision that he would need to hunt on his own. So he now has an amazing retirement package with us here at Schlitz, where he can live out uh, the rest of his days as an educational ambassador bird. Peregrine falcons are one of the most popular birds used for falconry because they really are a bird that is built for speed and built for hunting. Peregrine falcons have incredibly stiff feathers and their wings are very tapered and long as well, giving them an amazing aerodynamic force, aerodynamic uh, shape to them. So Cutright's wings are folded behind him right now. If I were to turn him around, you can kind of see how sharply pointed those wings are if they were to be stretched out wide. Peregrine falcons also have an incredible respiratory system. They have to breathe very efficiently since they are going to be flying at speeds about three times as fast as a cheetah. So it'd be kind of hard to see on cut right, but on his nostril, if he turns to face right above that beak, there is a little bony structure right in the center of his nostril. And that is called a tubercle. And that tubercle um, slows down the air pressure as well as pushes that air away from the nostril because air coming in that quick could certainly damage a bird's lungs. Peregrine falcons also have incredible eyesight. And they have a third eyelid called the nictitating membrane, which goes across the eye rather than up and down. And it is a semi-transparent membrane that during the fastest points of their flight 
They enclose that membrane and they act kind of like goggles. So no dust and debris are getting into their eyes during a flight. And peregrine falcons have one of the coolest hunting techniques. What they do is they fly high up in the air, fold those wings down to get maximum aerodynamic force and fly down and actually dive bomb their prey mid-air. And that dive bomb can reach speeds up to 240 miles per hour. So peregrine falcons are certainly the fastest animal in the world. That hunting style is called a stoop. If you guys look on YouTube, there's some pretty cool videos of peregrine falcons hunting in a stoop. Um, definitely would recommend checking those out. It's probably one of the coolest things you can see for a hunting technique from an animal. So since falcons are absolute hunting machines in the air, their diet consists, of course, of other animals that fly, such as small to medium birds like pigeons, starlings, shorebirds, ducks, really anything they can get those long, big talons on. But since the peregrine falcon is so good at hunting other birds, it's really hard for them to switch their diet and hunt another animal on the ground. It wouldn't be as safe to dive bomb an animal and potentially hit their head straight on on the ground instead. So the peregrine falcon is what you call a specialist carnivore, meaning an animal that eats a few specific types of um, prey, mainly like birds. And this is different than a generalist species who would eat a wide range of prey. So here's an example of that specialist food chain. Peregrine falcons eat the birds. Those birds mainly are eating insects and other plants as well. So this food chain here with our plants, our insects, our birds, and our peregrine falcon does tend to work pretty well, unless of course something disrupts this food chain, disrupts a link in that food chain. Unfortunately, back in the 1950s, something did disrupt this food chain, and that was a pesticide called DDT. DDT was a pesticide used a lot throughout the United States and throughout the world at this time period, and farmers were spraying it all over our food crops. Now, while DDT did an amazing job at its job and killed those insects, what was happening also was that these um, infected insects were being eaten by these birds. And of course, the birds were being eaten by the peregrine falcons. So DDT was moving up the food chain. And not only was it moving up the food chain, it was also increasing up the food chain as well. Because one bird isn't going to eat one insect and one peregrine falcon isn't going to eat just one bird. So it's moving up the food chain and to the point where peregrine falcons were eating the equivalent of a field's worth of DDT. So this process is called biomagnification and DDT was getting into the peregrine falcons throughout um, this time period until about 1972 when the use of DDT was banned in the United States. What DDT was doing to the falcons, it wasn't directly killing them, but it was affecting their eggshells. It was weakening the peregrine falcons' eggshells to the point where when the mother falcons would sit down on their eggs on the nest, those eggs would actually crush under the weight of those mother peregrine falcons, leading to multiple failed breeding seasons. And of course, the peregrine falcon population then began on a steep decline. But thankfully that ban of DDT and the peregrine falcons were put on the endangered species list. And since then, we've been doing a lot in Wisconsin to try bringing those populations back to where they used to be. So researchers are working on banding birds, releasing these birds, and as well as a lot of organizations are building nest boxes. So on the right here is a picture of a falcon at a nest box. Peregrine falcons do like to build their nests up very high. So places like We Energies will build safe nest boxes 
for peregrine falcons at their power plants as well. So thankfully peregrine falcon uh, populations have been going back up, but even 48 years after that ban on DDT, they are still on our endangered species list in the state of Wisconsin. So it just goes to show you one small thing can really leave a very long lasting impact. And I will take any questions about cut right or about peregrine falcons. Um, Liz, Marie was interested in how do you tell the difference between a, a, a falcon and a hawk in flight? Yeah, so like I was saying, the peregrine falcons, their wing um, silhouette is much more pointed. So a peregrine falcon's wings are a lot more tapered at the end because they are built for that aerodynamic speed to cut through the wind. A hawk will have a more of a rounded wing uh, silhouette since they are mainly perch and pounce predators or predators that are going to be making it their way through the trees, not wide open spaces like the peregrine falcon. And Patty was kind of curious about the coloration, especially of this falcon, because it's um, not the coloration that we typically see of peregrine falcons in Wisconsin. Can you talk a little bit more about the differences in plumage that you see in peregrine falcons? Yeah, so there are actually 19 different subspecies of peregrine falcons throughout the world. Um, peregrine falcons are a global bird. They could be found on every single continent except Antarctica. The word peregrine is actually Latin for wanderer. So they are found pretty much everywhere. And that color differ differentiation is seen dependent on region. So the northern peregrines, a little bit darker like this. I know if you head a little bit further south, they get a little bit more brown to them, a little bit lighter as well. But that coloration differences is um, difference by region. Good, um, well, thank you. Um, and I think, let me see, there is a, well, actually I get to ask a question. Um, I am just, you mentioned it briefly, but I'd like you to talk more. I'm absolutely fascinated by those huge feet that a peregrine falcon have because they're just so different from most other raptors in proportion to the whole body size. Can you talk about that a little more? Yeah, their proportions are quite a bit different than other birds. And those feet really help them grasp onto birds even almost the same size as him as well. So they can take down birds pretty much the size of ducks as well. But their whole body composition, their whole body proportions is all built for that speed and built for their hunting. So we can go all into their, their breastbone and how their eyes are shaped, but everything is built for that hunting. But those feet definitely help them take down even large prey, such as ducks. Good. And I'll pass it off to Ian for our last bird. Thank you again. All right, thank you, Liz. Now the star of eagle watching days is indeed the bald eagle. Here on my glove, I have Valkyrie. Valkyrie is our female bald eagle. Right now at her high winter weight, she is coming in over 12 pounds. So a modest size Thanksgiving turkey. Um, <clears throat> this bird has a wingspan of over six feet and is just an absolute dream right now. If at any point through the next 10-ish uh, minutes, you hear a loud kiar coming from off screen, I think, there we go. Atlas, our red shoulder hawk, can see Valkyrie through a single hole in her crate um, and is feeling a little territorial. So I'm gonna back up a bit and put Valkyrie on a stick so that I don't have to hold 12 pounds. Now, despite being such a large and powerful bird, eagles were also affected by DDT. As DDT entered the, and there's that call. As DDT entered the fields, as it was being sprayed by humans, Occasionally it would run off into rivers and into collections of water, ponds, lakes. From the water, it moved into the invertebrates, the fish, and into eagles. And just as we saw in peregrine falcons, 
one peregrine falcon doesn't eat just a single bird, and one eagle doesn't eat just a single fish, which doesn't eat just a single invertebrate. So when DDT was introduced to the eagles community, it biomagnified all the way up, and eagles were getting a lion's portion of DDT in their systems. Now, this also affected the reproduction of bald eagles across the U.S., especially in Wisconsin. Um, eagle eggs are about three inches long and should be able to hold about 100 to 150 pounds of pressure. But because of DDT interrupting how these birds processed calcium, bald eagle eggs were cracking underneath the mother and father birds as they share their incubation. So in 1974, we had um, only a handful of nests. In 1979, there were 151 active nests in Wisconsin. And then after DDT was banned and these eagles were placed on the endangered species list, the bald eagle went from threatened in Wisconsin to of no concern in Wisconsin. In 2019, which was the last nest uh, census, there were 1,684 active bald eagle nests in Wisconsin. Now that's a great news for us. Not only is this a beautiful bird and it's so cool to see our nation's symbol just out in the wild, um, almost at every glance if you're in the right habitat, but these birds are also indicators of the health of their system. If bald eagle populations are changing, that means the communities they inhabit are also changing. And if you can see bald eagles around you either during the winter or during the breeding summer times, that means you're in an area that is healthy for these birds. Now, <clears throat> obviously we celebrate bald eagle watching days as Jeb shared earlier because these birds can be found in mass numbers. And that is so cool to see congregations of eagles um, as they move around Wisconsin and move around in the day. They do this not because they're social in winter, but because they need to survive. You can imagine. As a bird that predominantly hunts fish, it would be pretty difficult to hunt fish through ice if you don't have a saw. So these birds will move around to available large bodies of water, typically spring-fed rivers or large lakes where they can consistently find fish. <clears throat> In the wintertime, they sort of dissolve their territorial behaviors and they adapt their behaviors so that they can find food for themselves and just, I'm not going to worry about my neighbor. They can handle themselves. I'm going to handle myself. When the days warm up, on warm winter days where there are thaws, bald eagles will radiate out and look for carrion. Um, just like turkey vultures, bald eagles will not turn down a free meal. So as Jeb mentioned, large open fields, safe areas where they have good uh, lines of sight. You may see bald eagles along roads or in fields either scavenging off roadkill or animals that just couldn't make it in winter. And then especially in spring, these birds move away from their winter territories or their winter congregations, as it were, to find good nesting territories and raise a family. Now we can take advantage of their winter behavioral adaptations as they change their diets and their locations and how much they care about one another. Um, we can take advantage of that and find them, and I encourage you to either <laughs> through the rest of Bald Eagle Watching Days or in winters to come. But unfortunately, behaviorally adapting their food sources sometimes opens eagles up to dangers. <clears throat> While DDT was banned many years ago, there is one main toxin, which we've already discussed today, that puts bald eagles at threat in Wisconsin, and that is lead. Now lead is a material that uh, life in general doesn't enjoy. It was banned for human use in paints and uh, gasoline and pencils. 
Atlas is having her words. Um, but lead is traditionally used in a lot of hunting sports or fishing sports in fishing tackle, bullets, or shotgun shells. And it's very, very cheap. So while it's been banned for all uses, it is still out in our animal communities. If a lead sinker falls off a line or is consumed by a fish, it enters the active hunting food web of an eagle. Or if a hunter shoots a deer, for instance, that bullet can fragment and shatter up to a foot and a half away from where the bullet enters that animal. And if any fragments of that lead bullet are left in the woods or in the fields or wherever that animal dies, it can enter all of our scavengers, coyotes, crows, turkey vultures, and eagles. Now, the Raptor Center in St. Paul, I've mentioned them before, they are a rehabilitation center for injured birds of prey. Over 80% of the eagles that they treat every year, and they see between 100 to 200, depending on the year, over 80% of their eagles have more than a background level of lead in their system. If lead doesn't outright kill a bird, it can cause behavioral impairments as it causes a neurological or brain decline in their activity. So being lightly poisoned with lead can contribute to eagles getting struck by cars because they can't take off quick enough, or it may cause them to judge distances differently and get tangled up in power lines and die from electrocution. And power lines and vehicle collisions are the largest causes of bald eagle mortality in Wisconsin. Third is direct poisoning from lead. <clears throat> That's about 15% of eagle deaths based off a 2009 DNR study. And that's from just direct poisoning. They consumed a piece of lead no larger than a grain of rice, and they declined into a slow, painful death. Now, I mentioned before the primary sources of lead in bald eagles are fishing tackle and ammunition. And I firmly believe that no one steps onto a dock or hops into a boat or sits down in a tree stand intending to kill a bald eagle. But these birds are opportunists. They'll take any opportunity they can to find food. And spikes in lead-related eagle deaths occur during and right after hunting season in Wisconsin. So while lead is cheap and traditional, these birds and scavengers around Wisconsin are paying the price for human convenience. Now here at Schlitz, we urge people to use tin and copper alternatives to lead sinkers and lead ammunition. And we hope that as you celebrate the thousands of eagles in our state, and as you interact with Valkyrie in our programs, <clears throat> that you take some time to consider the choices Take some time to consider the choices that you make and how they affect the animals around you and to spread the word about the lead poisoning crisis in Wisconsin's eagles. Now with that, we are running a little bit long on time. I do want to take two questions about Valkyrie and then I'll hand us back to Liz. Ian, thank you. And thank you to Valkyrie. Um, her vocalizations add yeah. a great deal to the presentation. Uh, and also teach people that uh, what they hear as eagle calls on movies usually are not. Um, but um, uh, Patty was interested in what is, does Wisconsin have the highest eagle population breeding, I presume she means, after Alaska? Yeah, that's a great question, Patty. Um, <clears throat> now, during the DDT crisis, Wisconsin was one of the few states that didn't have all of our eagles extirpated or locally extinct. The lowest we ever got was threatened, um, down to uh, probably about 300 eagles breeding in Wisconsin. Um, Wisconsin has the, we're tied for the third highest eagles in the US. Obviously, Alaska um, is a much bigger state with a lot of fish and water, so they have the most eagles. Florida, while those eagles are much smaller because they don't have to survive the bitter winters, Florida has more eagles than us. And then Minnesota and Wisconsin are both hovering around 
um, 3,000 to 4,000 eagles breeding in our state. So we are very well blessed with our nation's bird here in Wisconsin. Do you know of any estimate for the uh, number of wintering eagles in Wisconsin? Uh, the number of wintering eagles in Wisconsin? I do not know that measure off the top of my head. Liz or Jeb, you may, but if we don't have the answer, I encourage you to check out the DNR's website or to use Google and find reputable sources about surveys that have been done in years past. Liz or Jeb, do you know how many wintering eagles there are? No, I would, uh, I would go around the question and say it varies from one time of winter to another and also from one winter to the next. It's just a tremendously yes, that, variable. That would be a, a good way to answer that question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Liz, um, some summary or parting, parting comments? Yes, of course. Um, so thank you, of course, for um, joining us here today for our wonderful celebration of these birds and this live stream. So today we met five native predatory bird species each possessing their own specialized adaptations that help them survive out in the wild. And each of these birds we met today actually face unique threats to their survival. So our barred owls and our red-shouldered hawks rely on those certain types of habitats, those wetlands. Specialists like peregrine falcons rely on their specialized habitat. And scavengers like turkey vultures and even bald eagles rely on safe carrion free of any harmful toxins. So as we close out today, our celebration of Wisconsin raptors, I encourage each and every one of you to be mindful and consider how each raptor's ability to thrive depends on the choices that we make. So thank you again. Thank you, Jeb. And we look forward to um, seeing you guys next year, hopefully, and enjoy the rest of your weekend, the rest of Bald Eagle watching days as well. You are most welcome, Liz. And thank you, Liz, and thank you, Ian, and thank you for each and every one of the five birds that you showed us. Um, it's great to be able to be uh, live and up close um, with these individuals. Um, as we explore Bald Eagle Watching Days. So we appreciate it very much. Thanks to your donations, bald eagles are back in Wisconsin, but there's still many species in need. Donate to the Endangered Resources Fund on your Wisconsin income tax form and your gift amount will be doubled. Together we saved bald eagles. Now let's bring back the rest. So these birds, um, they reach us deeply and it is important that we reach out to help them to help them to survive. But if we only do that one species at a time, we will fail. There are many, many, many species imperiled that need help, and they need that help at the same time. And so I'm really uh, um, very pleased that David Stokes is willing to join us because he has this really hard task of going from a charismatic species like the eagle to dealing with all the other species that we have and that we share this world with. But he is taking on that challenge with some humor as well as lots of good information. And I'm very thankful that David is with us today. And as important, after David's presentation, we'll also go to some question and answer so that you'll be able to ask questions directly. David's live here in the studio with us and um, you'll be able to ask him or address questions to him as well. So without further ado, David, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Jeb. Hi, everybody. Everybody say good day, <laughs> friends. Please make two hooks like this. This means friend in sign language. I like to use sign. It tells me if you're paying attention. Everybody say good day, friends. Yeah, I'm going to remove my mask now because here in the auditorium, we are socially distanced. Everybody's about 10 feet away and there's only a few of us here. I want you to be able to hear me really well and to see my lips move. Yeah, so everybody say good day, friends. My name is David. And sometimes they call me a bald eagle. Yeah, if you don't have a hat like this, you gotta make a bald eagle like this. Everybody make a bald eagle. Now make the sign for a hawk. Wait a minute. Are hawks and eagles the same? Repeat after me. Repeat after me. 
Say what I say. Say what I say. I promise. I promise. To write a letter to the sign language experts and tell them that hawks and eagles are not the same. The sign should not be the same. <laughs> Forget about that. Everybody make an eagle sign. Yeah. If you don't have a hat like this, you've got to make a bald eagle like this. Now, why do they call me a bald eagle? Yeah. Everybody say, because you're bald. Yeah. Are bald eagles really bald? Nope. Everybody say, nope. What color is an eagle's head? Everybody say, white. Pick some lint off. You go like this. Say, white. How old does an eagle have to be to have a white head? Everybody say, five. I have some friends. Everybody make some fri- friends. I have some friends in Minnesota. Point to Minnesota. <laughs> Whatever direction that. Point to Minnesota. Yeah. My friends in Minnesota who work with eagles say anywhere from three to seven years of age is when eagles get their white heads. Everybody say, five is right in the middle. <laughs> yeah. So if you see, everybody say, see, an eagle flying around where you live and it has a white head, chances are it's five years old. Raise your hand if you're five years old. Raise your hand if you're not five years old. <laughs> yeah. Forget about that. But I want to read you a riddle. Actually, I want to give you some advice. Advice from an animal. This is advice from an animal written by a friend of mine, Elon Shamir, in YourTrueNature.com. YourTrueNature.com. Figure that one out. Raise your hand if you think you know what animal I'm talking about. Wait. Wait. Let's make the sign for animal. Everybody make the sign for animal. It goes like this. Ready? When I do this, some of my friends go like this. <laughs> What's that supposed to be? Everybody say, chicken dance. Make a bird. Make a bird. Question. Did you ever eat a bird? Yeah. Chicken is a bird. Everybody make a bird. Did you ever eat a dead bird? Everybody say, chicken nuggets taste great. Yeah. We eat birds. Birds are very, very important. I want you, a bird is a type of an animal. Make the sign for animal. This advice comes from an animal. Let's see if you can guess who it is. All right. Cherish freedom. Honor the earth and sky. See the big picture. Let your spirit soar. Fly high. Bald is beautiful. Yeah. Everybody say, bald eagle. Yeah, it's a bald eagle story. Advice from a bald eagle. I happen to bring along a bald eagle here today. Everybody say, that's not real. (laughs) I know. It's a toy eagle, but I think it's a girl. You know why? Because she's bigger. In the eagle world, the girls are bigger than the boys. Yeah, and the biggest eagles weigh, you ready for this? About 10 to 14 pounds. The biggest ones, the girls, 10, a big one would be 14 pounds. The males, the boys, are about 7 pounds. They are not very big. I have, I have a, a here's the boy right here. <laughs> Everybody say, he's not that tiny. Oh, listen to this. Raise your hand if you can hear this. Everybody try that. If you hear that sound, you should look up because the chances are it's a bald eagle close by. Now this toy, I had to paint the beak. I got to repaint it. And I forgot the feet. Yeah, because they have yellow feet and a yellow beak and a white head. Now, who knows what's an eagle's favorite food? Everybody say, fish! Everybody say, that's not real. Yeah. I know it's not real because it doesn't stink. <laughs> How many of you think fish stink? Yeah, my dad didn't like fish. Anytime that we had fish, it was usually uh, fish sticks, which are, I'm not sure that's real fish. Never mind. Sorry, mom. But guess what? Fish, yeah, fish are very important as e- food for eagles. And I also, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, another, oh, and, uh, yeah. Another kind of fish. All right, let's see what else we got here. Let's see. Oh, 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 I can't believe this. I can't believe this. And I think my friend Jeb said, by the end of February, eagles might might be nesting and the eggs might... It's an egg. (laughs) Wait, look. Oh, oh, oh. (laughs) Everybody say, looks like a chicken. (laughs) Get back in there. Get back in there. I don't want to go in there. (laughs) Just stay stay in there for a minute. Yeah, eagles are one of my favorite. And I want to tell you this. We're going to talk today about eagles and who lives around the eagles. Animals who live with eagles. Now, one of my favorite things to tell you is this. I got a special hat. It's not new. It's my loon hat. Can you tell? Is this a 
an adult bird like a, a female loon or maybe the male loon? Does anybody see the baby on the back? Yeah. Sometimes when you're in Wisconsin, and especially the lakes in the northern part of the state, you might hear, you all, you might hear this. If you hear a loon calling in the middle of the day, look up, because chances are there's an eagle flying overhead. Eagles and loons don't mix real well. Sometimes a baby eagle might be eaten, might be preyed upon by an eagle. Now I'm going to tell you this. If an eagle eats a loon, it's not mean, it is just hungry. I'm not mean, I'm just hungry. Hungry as can be. That loon looks cute to you, but it looks like food to me. And so I'm going to catch him. Eat him if I can. If you've ever been hungry, maybe you can understand why the eagle is a predator and the loon is the prey. The eagle just wants to catch that loon. The loon just wants to get away, get away, get away. Thank you to my friend Billy B. Billy B. Productions for writing that great song, I'm Just Hungry. He was thinking about a duck and a fish, but whatever. If you hear this sound from the loon tune... Chances are, look up in the summer, there might be an eagle flying overhead. Now, I want to talk about some important animals that, that feed eagles. I was told in college, I won't mention where I went to school. Some of you might know. <laughs> yeah. In college, I was told, if you want to understand the owl, everybody make an owl. Wait a minute. Having owl's eyes is like having toilet paper tube stuck to your eyeballs. <laughs> yeah. If you had eyes like this, if you wanted to look up, you'd have to turn your head up. If you want to look down, you have to turn your head down. Owls have the ultimate tunnel vision. Let's try this. Pray, just practice this. Everybody, hang on to your beard. I mean your chin. Hang on to your chin. Now, don't move your head. Look at the ceiling. Look at the floor. Look to the left, look to the right. Everybody look at my eyeballs. Pretty cool, huh? You and I can wiggle our eyes. Owls cannot. People think. Everybody say, think. Dream. Believe. Learn. Let's try it. Everybody say, Think. Think. Why would an owl want eyeballs that are stuck? Scientists think, oh, everybody make, go like this, say science. This means science in sign language. Now make two Bs, ready? Biology. Two Cs, chemistry. Two Ps, physics. Now make rock and roll. Now look like your grandpa, though. I used to say your dad, but it's your grandpa now. Forget about that. Owls, some people, scientists think, owls have stuck eyeballs because wherever they look, they are listening in the same direction. A friend of mine, oh, I just happened to bring along an owl here today. Yeah. Everybody say, that's not real. Yeah. It's a toy owl. I think it's a, I think it's a girl. You know why? She's bigger. <laughs> Wait, I got the boy right here. I got the boy right here. Here's the boy right here. <laughs> yeah. Everybody say, that's not real. Now, a friend of mine told me an owl can turn its head all the way around once. Because if it did, it would break its neck. Underneath all that, uh, that skin, that feathers and muscles, everybody feel your neck. Everybody feel your neck. We have bones underneath our neck, our, our neck muscles, that are called vertebrae. Let's practice language. Everyone say cervical vertebrae. Everybody say vertebrae. You and I as mammals, everybody make a mammal. Got to have two hands, but I'm only got, I got one busy right here. Mammals, all mammals have seven neck vertebrae. Yeah, people have seven neck vertebrae. The tiniest shrew has seven neck bones. The tallest giraffe has seven neck bones. Owls have 14. Ducks and geese have 15. Swans have 22. Yeah, pretty amazing thing. And owls are one of my favorite. What's an owl's favorite food? Everybody say, mice! <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is a gingerbread mouse. Now get back in there. I don't want to go in there! Just stay in there for a minute. So, yeah. A friend of mine said, if you want to understand the owl, you have to interview the mouse. Whoops. Yeah. Don't let the mouse go in the auditorium. Everybody say, stay. Yeah. Let me know if it gets off my head, all right? Mice, everybody make a mouse. Mice are important food for owls. I love mice. I'm not going to eat a mouse, but I would if I had to. There was a movie one time where a guy ate a mouse. Never mind. I ate lima beans once, but that was a different story. Yeah. If you want to understand the owl, you have to interview the mouse. Now, before we get back to the eagle, let me, sh let me ask you this. Uh, everybody say, these are not ears. That's not a question, actually. Everybody say, these are not ears. These are feathers. They're not ears. Some people call them ear tufts. Better to call them feather tufts. They stick up here, and we're not exactly sure why. 
Owls don't talk to us. We make a guess about animals. We call that guess science. We think the owl has great horned owls have feathers that stick up like this to break up their outline so they are easier to camouflage. The barred owl, woo, 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 the barred owl doesn't have feather tufts like this on top. Now, watch me trace the owl's ears. You ready? Watch it again. I'm going to trace the owl's ears. Owl's ears face forward like a satellite dish right on the side of their face. Wherever the owl looks, they are listening in the same direction. Scientists think that the owl has stuck eyeballs because wherever they look, they are listening in the same direction. Now, we talked about eagles. If you want to understand the eagle, you have to interview the fish. So I brought some fish with me here today. Everybody say, hello, fish. Yeah, these are my friends. These are suckers. These are, wait, shiners. These are shiners. Yeah, and they're pretty good size. And they're still alive. You know why they're still alive? I had them in cold water. Cold water holds more. Make two O's. Make two O's. Bring them together. Oh, 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 Try it again. Ready? Oh, 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 Cold water holds more oxygen. The magic of water. Make a W. Everybody say water. The magic of water is that as it gets colder, when it reaches 32, it freezes, and then it floats. Yeah, the colder the water gets, it gets to freezing, and then it floats. And so water underneath the frozen, like the bottom of a lake, might be uh, 39 degrees Fahrenheit, which gives us about the best oxygen possible. Fish are active in the winter, by the way. They're active underneath the ice. When people go ice fishing, they're not going to catch dead fish. They're going to drink beer. I mean, they're going to catch fish that are still alive. And these shiners might be great food for an eagle. Yeah, I'm going to, oh, baby. Oh, baby. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no animal. Now, I'm going to tell you this. This, hey, pretty slippery. Slippery as a fish. Check out this fish. Oh, yeah. Oh, and do you know that fish have waterproof eyeballs? They have waterproof eyeballs. Yeah, I do that too. Fish are important for food for eagles. But guess what? I have a friend that I haven't met yet. He's kind of a friend on, uh, uh, I guess, on email. Yeah, you can call him a friend. His name is Dan Goltz. He works for the Wisconsin DNR. He sent me a couple pictures. I want you to see this. Pictures. He climbs trees. Everybody make a tree. Big tree, little tree, dead tree. <laughs> Eagles build their nests in trees. He climbs trees to examine what eagles like to eat and maybe even to ban the eagles, put a ban. This is a picture he took of something he saw in an eagle's nest. I don't know if you can see this. Does anybody see a jaw? Does anybody see some teeth? Show me your teeth. Now, I thought maybe this was a raccoon skull, but my friend Jeb, guess what? He's a scientist. He said, looks more like an opossum. Go like this. I don't know the sign for a possum, but I might use this. You know why? Opossums have a thumb on their back foot. Opossums have a thumb on their back foot. Yeah, and they drag their tail usually. And many opossums, 60, 70 years ago, there weren't any opossums in Wisconsin. 60 or 70 years, no opossums. They move from south to north because they're not picky eaters. Raise your hand if you're a picky eater. Yeah. Opossums will eat just about anything. And along the highways, from north to south, there's a lot of garbage along the highways. Opossums are smart, relatively speaking. That is, they're survivors. They're not endangered. Opossums will eat what's left over. Did you ever have a quarter pounder and uh, there's some cheese that kind of leaked out on the package? How many of you actually licked that cheese? Yeah, some of us do, but a lot of people just throw it away. And then that piece... That litter on the ground, opossums find that food to eat. So this might be an opossum with some fish. And there's something else. I don't know if you can see this. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else was found in an eagle nest. Everybody say turtle shell. Everybody make a turtle. Put the shell on. Take the shell off. Ouch! <laughs> you, can't, you can't take the shell off. Make a turtle. Put the shell on. Take the shell off. Ouch! Everybody say stop it. Make a turtle. Put the shell on. Only on television does the turtle jump out of its shell, take a bath, and get back in. The turtle shell is the turtle's back. Everybody say, prove it! All right, I'm going to prove it. 
I happen to have along here a turtle shell from a common snapping turtle. This one, I'm going to guess, is about 50, was about 50 years old. You know how I know? I'm going to show you a 32-year-old in a couple minutes. I don't know if you remember, but Art, when he did a blessing for the eagle, when Marge released the eagle, he had a turtle, snapping turtle shell, where he had some sage burning inside. Yeah, and he was using a turtle shell. This is the turtle's back. Check out the backbone. Yeah, the turtle shell is the turtle's back. Turtle shells have been found in eagle nest. Turtle shells like maybe from a painted turtle, like this one. This one's been bleached, so you could touch it. If you ever see me sometime, we might get a chance to touch these things. This also can be binoculars if you're in Star Wars. You can see the backbone inside. Turtle shells have been found in eagle nests. Do turtles climb trees? Everybody say, in your dreams. <laughs> in your dreams, lots of things can happen. But if you see a turtle climbing a tree, get a picture. Get a video. Make sure you have the data. Never mind. Let, let me show you a turtle I have here today. This is a three-year-old common snapping turtle. How do I know it's three years old? I've had it for three years. Everybody say, drip dry, drip dry, drip dry. Everybody say, bite me, <laughs> bite me. Okay, it's not biting me. Maybe everybody say, not yet. Why doesn't it bite me? I don't know, but I want you to believe your eyes. Believe what you see. This is a common snapping turtle. It has a super long tail like a dinosaur. It has long toenails like your mom. It has a tiny shell on the bottom. Let's practice language. Everyone say carapace. Everybody say carapace. Everybody say plastron. The plastron. Now if this turtle was five or six years old, if you look at its plastron, if it's flat, it's a girl. If it has a dent, it's a boy. The plastron, the belly of a snapping turtle and a box turtle. If the belly is flat, it's a girl. If it's dented, it's a boy. That's if they're at least five or six years old. Now, this turtle can do a magic trick. Let's see if I can show you the magic trick. It's pretty amazing. These turtles don't like to be on their backs. Check it out. Did you see that? Did you see that? Everybody say, roll over, Beethoven. <clears throat> I said that once, roll over, Beethoven. And a kid said, they don't know music. I'm not going to tell you what school I was at in Milwaukee, but, you know, pretty amazing thing. These turtles use their head to flip over. It could bite me. I'm going to tell you this. If you pick up a snapping turtle outside in nature, chances are it will bite you. Yeah. Everybody smile. Everybody say, I could bite you. <laughs> I'm not going to bite you, but I could bite you. Yeah. Turtles can bite. They bite when they eat. Yeah. Turtles bite when they eat. You know what? So do people. I want you to meet an eight-year-old. How do I know it's an eight-year-old? I've had it for eight years. This one, is this a snapping turtle? Is this a snapping turtle? Everybody say, drip dry, drip dry. Yeah. Everybody say, bite me. This one had its mouth open just a second ago. It's a painted turtle. Everybody say, hello, painted turtle. This painted turtle has long toenails in the front. I think that means it's a boy. When you think about mud turtles like painted turtles, look at their toenails to know if it's a boy or a girl. Long toenails in the front is a boy. Long toenails in the back is a girl. It's a, de it's a guess. If they lay eggs, it's a girl. Okay. No, no, yeah. So why would the girl want long toenails in the back? Everybody say, think. Long toenails in the back help you dig a hole to lay your eggs. Why does the boy have long toenails in the front? Everybody say, to hang on to the girl. <laughs> if you don't know what this means, talk to your parents later. Yeah, everybody say, bye-bye painted turtle. Now I want you to meet a snapping turtle. And uh, this one's 32 years old. How do I know it's 32 years old? I've had it for 32 years. I went to the Valley Fish Market. The Valley Fish Market in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. Yeah. By the Mississippi River. Make two R's. Yeah. About close to a place where the Wisconsin River runs into the Mississippi River. Make a river. Yeah. I went to the Valley Fish Market. And I asked, I don't know if it was Mike Valley, but I thought it was the Valley because of the but it was, his name was, never mind. Anyhow, I said, do you have any snapping turtles? He said, yeah, I got one yesterday. He said, he said uh, well, how, I asked him, how big is it? He said, 20 pounds. So in a book, everybody make a book. In a book, it says wild snapping turtles grow one pound a year. So a 20 pound snapping turtle would be 20 years old. Yeah, and I've had this for 12 years longer than that. That would be 
20 plus 32 years old. I'm going to bring this one out. By the way, I don't say bite me to this one because it would bite. Yeah, yeah. This is a common snapping turtle. It lives whole. You would turn around, wouldn't you? And this, everybody say, drip dry, drip dry, drip dry. <laughs> yeah. We're waiting for the drips to come off. Yeah, everybody say, tiny belly. This is a common snapping turtle with webbed feet. Snapping turtles can be a problem for eagles. If a young eagle or an eagle gets in the water somehow, snapping turtles might prey upon them. Not because they're mean, because they're hungry. Check out this face and look at that neck. Snapping turtles are one of my favorite. Snapping turtles and other turtles can be food for eagles. Everybody say, bye-bye, snapping turtle. Now, I, want, I, touched the, I touched the snapping turtle, so what do I have to do? Everybody say, baby wipes. <laughs> I have to wash my hands off with baby wipes. Now, a lot of you don't like baby wipes, but when you were a baby, you liked it when your mom wiped your bleep. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. Yeah, I'm going to wash my hands for 30 seconds after this with soap, all right? I want you to meet a different animal. And this animal, this animal is, uh, doesn't live in the water. Let's see. Oh, everybody, everybody say tortuga. You got to move your lips when you do it. Ready? Tortuga. Yeah, tortuga means turtle, a turtle in, in Spanish. Everybody say chiripaja. Try this without moving your lips. Ready? Never mind. Everybody say chiripaja. Chiripaja is Russian for turtle. Yeah, everybody say zhuv. That's Polish. Everybody say uh, uh, guai guai. Guai guai. That's Cantonese. Everybody say wu guai. Yeah, how do you say turtle in English? Turtle. This turtle is a box turtle. I'm going to bring it out. It was hit by a car in Missouri, and that's why I have it. Everybody say, cheeseburger! <laughs> I brought this out one time, and the kid said, looks like a cheeseburger! And I said, where's the cheese? Yeah. I'm going to give it a bath. Don't look! She's taking a bath. Don't look! Stop looking! Now, this turtle, if you notice, doesn't have a very big tail. Turtles who live in the water usually have a long tail. Now, don't mention the soft-shell turtle. The spiny and the smooth soft-shell turtle have tiny tails. Never mind. Forget about them. Most turtles that have long tails live in the water. Turtles that live on the land don't need the tail to be very long. And this one has a flat plastron, a flat belly. And she's wearing a turtleneck. <laughs> this is a female three-toed box turtle because she has three toes. Now, I want you to meet another turtle. This one came from, well, see if you can guess. It's a Russian tortoise. <laughs> came from Russia. Yeah, turtles like this. Everybody say, baby wipes. I got to get out another baby wipe. Here we go. I'm going to wipe this one off. These baby wipes are just kind uh, well, here we go. And, I, and this turtle loves to eat green leaf lettuce from all the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Turtles like this are one of my favorite. Turtles can be food for eagles and other creatures. Now, something else I want you to think about. Something else that was found in an eagle nest. You're not gonna believe this, but I'm not gonna lie to you today. All right? I don't know if anybody knows who this is. Everybody make a deer. Moose! <laughs> yeah, sorry, everybody make a deer, ready? Moose! Wait a minute, everybody make a deer. Yeah, did you fall off the cliff? Yeah, Mo deer. Deer are one of my favorite. In Wisconsin, there are more deer now than there's ever been. Uh, yeah, there are more deer now than there's ever been because in long ago, before your grandparents were born, in the olden days, when bald meant white, bald eagle, bald-faced hornet, in the olden days, there were so many trees, there weren't as many deer. When loggers cut down the trees, new trees came up, and that was good for deer. There are more deer now than there's ever been. This is my deer. Do deer climb trees? If you see one climb a tree, get a picture. Make sure you date it. But guess what was found in an eagle nest? Everybody say, a deer foot. This is not a leg. This is a foot. Here's the heel. Here's the ball of the foot. The deer walks on the middle toenails. Let's try something. Stick out your hand like this and cut off your thumb. Don't cut off your thumb. Just pretend you don't have one. The deer doesn't have a thumb. Now take your pointer finger, put that over the top of your thumb and hold it there. Now put your pinky finger over the top of your thumb and hold it there. Make sure you got two fingers sticking out in the middle, not one, two. I don't see any similarity, Mr. Stokes. These two correspond to the hoofs. 
These two show up in the track. These two are the dew claws. We don't see those very often in a track unless there's deep snow, deep mud, or some people say a large animal. Now, Obi-Wan Kenobi said to Luke Skywalker, the sand people walk in a single file in order to... Some people say the sand people walk in a single file in order to hide their numbers. Deer walk in a single file. You know why? <laughs> because they have stinky feet. <laughs> Who doesn't, right? Everybody try this. Who can do this? Separate your fingers like this. Right between those hoofs on the deer, there's a scent gland called the interdigital gland. Every step, they leave a scent, and they follow their family member's scent. They walk in a single file, and many times they register. That means their front foot hits the ground, and the hind foot on the same side lands in the same spot. That's when they're just kind of walking around, not running. When they're running, new things change. Deer are one of my favorite. And deer, here is a fur coat from a deer a friend of mine sent to me from New York State. He hunted this, he harvested, he killed this deer for food, and then he gave it to me. <laughs> Pretty nice, huh? It's a fall coat, if you notice, it's not really red-brown. Yeah, and the inside of fur, by the way, is leather. A six-year-old said, how'd they stick the fur to the leather? <laughs> I said, good question. But if you've got leather on your shoes or your belt, or your motorcycle jacket, chances are it came from a cow. And that makes sense. If you use a cow to make steak and hamburger, you should use the skin for clothing. It's multiple use. Deer fur, deer fur is such good insulation. A lot of times, make some snow. Everybody makes snow. When snow falls on the back of a deer, it doesn't melt. Did you ever go outside and it's snowing like today? It was snowing earlier when we were watching eagles on the river. We could have done this. If all the snowflakes were candy bars and milkshakes, oh, what a snow it would be. We'd stand outside with our mouths open wide. You ready? Uh, 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 uh. If all the snowflakes were care bars and soy shakes, oh, what a snow it would be. That was the lactose intolerant. <clears throat> Sorry, Wisconsin Dairy State. Forget about that. But you know what? When snow falls on the back of a deer, it doesn't usually melt because deer fur is such good insulation. Now, did you ever see a place where a deer laid down? I call it a deer boat is probably incorrect. A deer bed, a place where a deer laid down, it might melt the snow because its body heat might compress. And yeah, and you can look for it to see if a deer laid there. Look for tracks, look for scat, and look for hairs. Hey, by the way, what's on your pillow in the morning besides a drool spot? Everybody say hair. Yeah. Look for the hair. And hair, deer, have more hairs per square inch on their skin in the summer than they do in the winter. Wait a minute. Deer have more hairs per square inch, thicker fur, I mean more hairs per square inch, in the summer rather than the winter. Why would they want more hair in the summer? Yeah. How would you like to have a foot like this and try to swat mosquitoes? <laughs> How did he die? I don't know. So in the wintertime, those hairs are hollow, like polar bear fur. They create something called dead air space. Everybody say, dead air space. Yeah. Deer are one of my favorite, and you might find evidence of deer in eagle nests. Because eagles, everybody make an eagle, are opportunists. If they find a dead deer on the road, they're going to eat it. Now, I was told by my friends in Minnesota that sometimes eagles get hit by cars because, well, think about this. Uh, raise your hand if you know who this, animal, this bird is. Oh, 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 oh. Everybody say crow. Everybody feel your head. <clears throat> Regardless of what your brother and sister say, you have a huge brain. Yeah. Crows have huge brains. They're one of the smartest birds around. Some people argue, said, maybe it's a gull. In northern Wisconsin, it's probably the raven. It doesn't matter. Crows, blackbirds are very smart. You, I have never, uh-oh, I, I almost lied to you. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Last year, I did see a road-killed crow. But most of the time, the, common, the American crow, the common crow, doesn't get hit by a car because they're smart. They see that car coming, and they get out of the way. Eagles are smart, too. But guess what? I was told by my friends in Minnesota that if an eagle is sitting on a roadkill deer and something approaches, something kicks in the eagle saying, this is my food, protect the food. And oftentimes they get hit by a car because they're, they're not afraid so much as they're protecting their food source. What I was told, I used to do this, and I try not to do it anymore. Like if you're eating an apple, throw it out your window because it's going to decompose. The problem with throwing the apple out the window, 
Mice might come to eat that apple on the side of the road. And then who comes in? Owls, hawks, eagles, other animals to eat what the mice are coming. And so it's better, don't put your apple core on the side of the road. Yeah, I want you to meet a couple other animals who might be in the habitats of eagles. Now, let's see here. We might have seen a fox. A fox might get preyed upon by an eagle. Excuse me. Everybody say, that's not real. <laughs> this is my toy fox. I know it's a red fox because it has a white tip on its tail. Red foxes have a white tip on their tail. Everybody make an R. Make your hand look like mine. Say red. Now make an F. Make your hand look like mine. Say fox. Ready? Red. Fox. Red fox is one of their favorite foods. Mice! <laughs> Everybody say, that's not real. Yeah, mice are very, very important. Get back in there. I don't want to go in there. Foxes and coyotes live in the same habitats as eagles, and they love to eat mice. Mice, I love mice. I don't eat mice. I would if I had to. But mice are food for many creatures. Now, I want to tell you, share with you a song, probably one of the most important animals in, the, in nature. And it happens to be, wait, is this on? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody say, it's not a guitar. <laughs> Whoa, ho, ho. put the perch upon it. Wait a minute, this is not a perch. What kind of fish is this supposed to be? Everybody say, a walleye. Everybody say, it's a toy. Yeah, it's supposed to be a walleye fish. Whoa, ho, ho. put the fish upon the tray. Whoa, ho, ho. feed your friends a fish filet. Whoa, ho, ho. satisfied till Saturday fry. Fish fry. Everybody say, thank you, Ken Longquist. Ken Longquist. Kenland.com, yeah, for that great song. Fish are really important food. Now, if you like eagles, you gotta appreciate fish. What do big fish eat? Everybody say, smaller fish. What do smaller fish eat? Everybody say, smaller fish. What do smaller fish eat? Smaller fish. What do really small fish eat? Everybody say, really small fish. Now, what do really, really small fish eat? Everybody say, Plankton! <laughs> Everybody say, Spongebob! <laughs> yeah. This is Sheldon from Spongebob. Excuse me, I have to talk to this plankton. Stop looking at me like that. Did you know? Everybody say no. This means no, you can't have a cookie. Everybody say no. This means I scoop up something, put it in my... Everybody say no. Did you know that outside in the water, outside in the river, in the lakes, there are small creatures called plankton? Plankton comes from the Greek word planktos, which means made to wander. Yeah, plankton lives out there, and this one's called the cyclops. Plankton is food for small fish. Small fish eat it, big fish eat smaller fish, and on up the food chain to eagles. Yeah, now, wait a minute. Do you see what I see? Everybody say a blue jay. Does anybody see a kind of blue? This is a snorkel, a snorkel. Question, why is there a snorkel in my fish bag? Why is there a snorkel in my fish bag? Because I put it there. Yeah. And some big fish might eat a snorkeler. I don't know. Maybe I don't. sharks. They found a lot of weird things in sharks. There's an animal I've already mentioned who has a snorkel attached to its abdomen. Remember this song goes like this? Ready? Head. Let's try it together. Ready? Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen, six legs, two antenna, and usually some wings. What about the compound eyes? Compound eyes. Isn't that how it goes? <laughs> when my daughter was in first grade, she hated this song. Everybody feel your head. Head. Is your head warm? Everybody say warm blood. Yeah, warm blood. Everybody put your hand on your heart and say blood. Everybody say, I love blood. I don't want to see blood, but I love blood. Everybody feel your head. Yeah. Now say thorax. Everybody say thorax. You have to move your lips when you say it. Ready? Thorax. Thorax is where the legs attach and the wings. Now, everybody grab your equator. Everybody say abdomen. Let's try it together. Ready? Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. Head, thorax, abdomen, abdomen. Six legs, two antenna, and usually some wings. What about the compound eyes? Compound eyes. Question, what animal did we just describe? Yeah, everybody say insect. Put your thumb in your nose, two antenna. Ready? Thumb on your nose, two antenna. This is insect in sign language. Who thinks they know the most important food for little fish in fresh water in Wisconsin? The most important food for little fish in fresh water Wisconsin is a plankton. Which plankton? Everybody say, mosquito! <laughs> Everybody say, that's not real! 
Is this a boy or a girl mosquito? Everybody say, it's a toy. It's supposed to be a girl. If this was the male, if this was the boy, the girl's ten times, you know, a lot of, never, I'd probably eat them, never mind. Mosquitoes, everybody make the sign for mosquito. A sign for mosquito, yeah. Mosquitoes are important food. The larvae of mosquitoes are important food in the water. And I'm going to tell you a secret. I want you to tell everybody you see. Mosquito larvas invented snorkels. Everybody say, scuba. Scuba. Scuba stands for self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. A snorkel is a little different. Snorkels were invented by mosquito larvae. Everybody say, nature did it first. Yeah. yeah. Who invented scuba? I did a program in 1970. Yeah. It was a Cousteau involvement day. Jacques Cousteau was there. I met him backstage. I was doing little things in a pond study, and he was doing the big... And anyhow, I asked him a question, because make a book. In a book it says, Jacques Cousteau invented scuba. I said to Mr. Cousteau, I said, Mr. Cousteau, who invented scuba? And he said, diving beetles. Diving beetles are an insect, harder to do on the left side, are an insect that carry a bubble of air attached to their abdomen, and they breathe with it. Everybody say, nature did it first. Yeah, I want you to meet a different animal that also likes to eat. Everybody say mice. I don't know if you're going to know who this is. Yeah, when I got out of my car today, a frog landed on my head. Everybody say, uh-uh. Make a fist, put it under your chin, push out two fingers. This means frog in sign language. Everybody say true frog. True frogs have webbed feet. Everybody say tree frog. Tree frogs have sticky toes. Go like this. Now everybody say toad. Everybody say, toads are frogs. Toads are in the frog family. And toads will not give you warts. Forget about that. Frogs are one of my favorite. I'm going to bring, it, bring out a frog that has spent, well, it, it lives in my bathroom at the house because there's water there. There's a source. I'm not talking about the toilet. Uh, yeah, water there so I can rinse the animals. And one time I was watching, I don't know, maybe it was a Packer game. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I was watching TV, and I heard, nom, nom, nom. I could hear the bullfrog making noise. And I think it's because sunlight energy, point to the sun, make a circle, shine on yourself. The sunlight energy is changing. Earlier today, we heard a cardinal. My wife heard a cardinal singing the spring song. Yeah, a couple days ago, I heard, listen to this, cheeseburger. Everybody say, cheeseburger. Try this. Cheeseburger. The chickadee, the black-capped chickadee was singing a spring song because even though we have a couple more months of winter, spring is coming. I want you to meet the bullfrog. Oh, oh, oh. Now, make a book. In a book it says frogs eat flies. You know why they say that? Nobody likes flies. <laughs> yeah, bullfrog's favorite food is other frogs. Bullfrogs eat other frogs. Why? Because they're hungry, not because they're mean. I want you to say hello to the bullfrog. Everybody say hello bullfrog. <laughs> yeah. Listen. Yeah, I'm going to clean this up later. I, I don't know if I had permission to do that. This is a common bullfrog. Happens to be a boy because it has big eardrums. Right behind the frog's eyes there's two big circles called the tympanum. Everybody say tympanum. Move your lips, ready? Tympanum. The bullfrogs, if the bullfrog's tympanum is bigger than the eye, it's a boy, smaller than the eye, it's a girl. And check out these webbed feet. Bullfrogs are one of my favorite in Wisconsin. And they eat other animals. One time, I saw a movie, so I know it's true. Yeah, I saw a garter snake grab the foot of a bullfrog. Mm -mm. Big mistake. Bullfrog turned and ate the snake. Yeah, animals do what they need to do to survive. Everybody say, bye-bye, bullfrog. Yeah. Everybody say, no splashing. Yeah. yeah. This is my friend, the bullfrog. Everybody say, peace, love, and frogs. Yeah. Everybody, let's try it again. Everybody say, peace. Go like this. Peace, love, frogs. Yeah. Now, there's one more animal I want you to see. It's one of my favorite. It's one of my favorite. And uh, you're going to hear me say, one of my favorite Everybody says, what's your favorite? Usually my favorite animal is whatever I'm holding. And 
uh, a couple months ago, it was my granddaughter. <laughs> Never mind. But guess what? I'm going to bring out an animal that's so comfortable. It likes to eat mice. It actually can climb trees. But it has no legs. Yeah. Everybody say, it's a snake. Everybody say, snake. Everybody say, when I bring out the snake now, do not scream. You know why? <laughs> because it bothers me. Yeah. And snakes don't have any, snakes don't have ears. They can't hear you. Well, some people say they feel vibrations, like the beating of a drum or the beating of your heart, which is like a drum. I'm going to bring out this snake. This snake is sometimes called the pumpkin snake. You know why? Everybody make an orange. Everybody say, anaranjado. Orange, anaranjado is orange in Spanish. This snake is a pumpkin snake. I'm going to call it a pumpkin snake. My friends call it the pumpkin snake. Everybody say, hello, pumpkin snake. Yeah. This snake is a red rat snake. It's in the rat snake family. It's related to the fox snake and the gray rat snake, which live in Wisconsin. This kind of snake does not live in Wisconsin unless it's a pet. And this is not an official pet because the hotel said no pets. Never mind. I put it on my head. You know why? Because I don't have to say, may I have your attention, please? Because my head is warm. Feel your neck. Is your neck warm? Everybody say warm blood. Feel your armpit. Is it warm? Everybody say warm blood. Feel your head. Regardless of what your brother and sister say, you got a huge brain. Everybody say warm blood. Yeah. I put the snake on my head because it warms it up. And the snake is a constrictor. This snake likes to eat mice. And it sticks out its tongue. I don't know if you can see. What color is its tongue? Can you see its tongue at all? Raise your hand if you can see its tongue. <laughs> it has a red tongue. And this one shed its skin fairly recently. It's called an amelanistic red rat snake. In a pet store, they call this a corn snake. I don't like the name corn snake because they don't eat corn. And they don't really live in the corn. And guess what? All snakes are predators. All snakes eat other animals. There are no vegetarian snakes. Red rat snakes have cousins in Wisconsin the fox snake, and the gray rat snake. Yeah, those are in the rat snake family. This kind of snake, now there's one last snake i got to show you before I say thanks for coming here today. Yeah, this snake came from India. India. And this snake likes to eat rats. Yeah. Oh. Everybody say, hello, python. <laughs> this is, oh, baby. Does that feel good on a bald head? Ah, the b stay out of my mouth, though. Stay out of my mouth. Oh, by the way, when I said amelanistic, that means it doesn't have any black color. A lot of times people say the corn snake has a black and white, like piano keys belly, so it looks like Indian corn. The problem with that is what corn is not? Indian corn. I don't like to call it Indian corn because all corn came from native people. All corn is native corn. Some's yellow, some's, you know, different kinds. Now, in a couple of minutes, you're going to get a chance to ask me some questions, I guess. I want to say thank you. Everybody say thank you. And I hope that I can visit you sometime, and maybe next year we'll be live along the river to learn about eagles in person. Get out with your family in a safe family group and look for birds. Eagles are birds. Look for all kinds of animals, evidence in the snow. So I want to say thank you to the Alliant Energy Foundation and other sponsors and to the Fairy Bluff Eco Council and the Trip Museum and the Wisconsin DNR and the Chamber of Commerce. I'm really happy to be here today. Have a great day. Bye, everybody. Oh, questions. There's going to be some questions. I think I'm ready for the questions. Great job. Great job, David. Um, we do have some questions. And John, who's in Chicago, he was very interested in your presentation, and he would like to know if turtles make good pets, and if so, which kind are the best to be a pet? Do turtle, everybody make a turtle, put the shell on. I think some turtles make really good pets. I think some turtles make really good pets. You have to think about this. You have to make sure you take care of them in the best way. Now, some people will get a turtle from the wild, especially like a water turtle. I don't think they make really good pets. 
because all turtles can carry salmonella bacteria that can make you sick, but it doesn't hurt the turtle. So turtles from the water, from the wild and in the water, probably aren't the best pets, although you can have them in a tank. I like a pet that I can hold, that I can touch, that I could... Who turned out the lights? Who turned out... Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I like an animal like a box turtle or a tortoise, one that was rescued or one that was raised in captivity. Land turtles, you can wash them, keep them clean, take care of them just like everything else. But remember, they need to have a space to be warm and cool, a place where they can warm up or cool down, some water, some food. <laughs> oh, by the way, there's some leftover skin here. If you were here today, I, I, would, I would auction this off. It would be a big price. Turtles, I think, are the best tortoises or box turtles. A box turtle is not a tortoise. A tortoise officially doesn't drink any water. It gets all of its water from the food it eats. But don't tell anybody, but my Russian tortoise will often drink water. But the books say no. You know, John in Chicago also has a very important question. He wants to know what kids, not adults, but what kids can do to help keep eagles safe. Uh, what can kids do to help keep eagles safe? Wow. Very important things to think about if you're a hunter or if you know a hunter or a fisherman is to start to use non-lead tackle and bullets and ammunition. Get other kinds of ammunition like copper and use something other than lead for your fishing so that eagles, a little tiny, tiny little bit of lead in an eagle's body, they don't pass it through their system when they poop. It gets built into their muscles and they can die from a tiny little bit. So that's the be best thing adults can do. Kids can do, start to learn about the animals. Realize that in your own backyard, like Chicago, there are eagles who live there. And if there's eagles there, man, one of my favorite places to go there is along the lake shore and look for great blue herons. There's one right over there. <laughs> Everybody say, that's not real. Great blue herons nest in big trees. And sometimes I've seen eagles in a great blue heron nest. Maybe they have to remodel or build it up bigger, but that's a good idea. Get out and learn about nature and tell your friends about it. And remember, it's not just in national parks and places way far away, it's right in your own backyard. So exploring nature, getting outside. Yes, in this day of COVID, watching nature videos is a good idea, but learn about things that live right where you are. Like the Chicago, uh, there's a group, hmm, ah, Chicago Parks, I often do programs for them. Chicago Parks has some great nature oasis things that you can get involved in. So you mean to say that if you learn more about nature, that you can help protect it? That's exactly what I mean. If you learn, everybody say learn, more about nature, you can learn how to protect it. Some people say that unless you love it, you won't take care of it. But I'm going to tell you a true story. Everybody say true. I didn't learn about animals and nature. Are you ready for this? until I got to college. Yeah. I grew up playing sports, and st which is good. And I played Army, even though my dad was is a Marine. Sorry about that. And we did all kinds of things, normal. We went camping, but I remember it rained a lot. And we had a tent that if you touched it, got wet. Never mind. We didn't go fishing. We didn't go hunting. I didn't learn about animals until I got to college. And I was asked to be in a seminar, and we read a great book called A Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold. And we read that book, and we watched geese. I think I hear one now. We heard geese fly into the Kellogg Biological Sanctuary. I won't tell you where that was. Sorry about that. But I learned about nature reading a book, and then I was able to go out with kids and explore nature, and I realized... They listened to me <laughs> when I was outside teaching. They listened to me. So I realized I could do that for a living. So if you are experiencing nature with your parents and you're still young, yeah, you got a head start. I'm kind of curious. Um, I started counting, but I lost track. You said that a lot of different animals eat mice. A lot of different animals eat mice. How, how is it that we have any mice left? Ah, 
Babies, lots of babies, four or five litters a year. Babies, mice, babies. Yeah, mice have babies. I'm going to tell you to do this. Get a plastic peanut butter jar. Scoop up some snow outside. Fill the jar with snow, but don't pack it. Just fill the jar with snow. Take it inside. It's too big for your armpit. Don't worry about that. Just take the, take the peanut butter jar with snow in it inside and melt it down. And you will notice that snow is mostly air. Snow has water, but it's mostly air. And because there's air and snow, animals can live under it. And mice can tunnel under the snow. They are so comfortable in the snow, they have babies under the snow. Four or five times a year, they can have babies. Ten babies at a time. When people have babies... Maybe one a year. Sometimes there's twins. Sometimes there's seven. And then you're on television. But guess what? Little mice have lots of babies. And because there's a lot of reproduction, there's always more to go around. Scientists tell us that prey, there's always more prey than there is predators. If there isn't enough, then there won't be, there won't be any predators. Animals won't be able to survive if they can't find food, especially in the wintertime. What fascinates you most about animals? What fascinates me most about animals is that they're different than me. Are yeah. They? Very few animals are bald. Yeah. Some have hair in all the weird, never mind, in their ears. Yeah. Yeah. Wait till you have hair in your ears. Yeah. I like them because they're so different. And I often like the underdog. I like the animal, the person who gets picked on. I try to stick up for that person. The animal that gets picked on. A lot of people don't like snakes. I don't want to be bit by a snake. But I learn about snakes and I'm fascinated by it. I don't want to be bit by a honeybee or a hornet. But I still appreciate them and understand that they fit into nature. Yeah, and even things we don't know where they fit, like ticks. I had Lyme disease once. I had Lyme disease, but I don't hate ticks. I have two children. When our children were born, we were told uh, if they act out, if they had bad behavior, attack the behavior, not the child. If a tick bites us, attack the behavior, not the tick. The tick is doing what it's supposed to do. It just so happens it can carry a disease that can hurt us. So we have to, like the virus now, we have to use science to try to figure out and take care of each other. I would guess that many of the people watching today really want to know, what is it like to hold a snake? What is it like to hold a snake? Is that, is that the question? Yes. Uh, I think it's awesome. A lot of times kids will tell me, they, they, see, they saw a bigger snake, and I said, that's great. And some people try to say, you need a bigger snake. And I said, get your own show. <laughs> I have the right number. People, how many animals do you have? I have the right number. Yeah. And I used to have to ask my wife, of, well, I don't even ask anymore. I don't need any more animals. I have just the right number. Because I like to think about frogs, turtles, and snakes. My business is called the Frog Chorus Nature Education. And I like to talk about frogs, turtles, and snakes, and animals who live in the habitats of eagles. And sometimes in August at the International Crane Foundation and the Crane Fest, I do animals who live with cranes. Some people wonder, why did you bring frogs, turtles, and snakes? When we're talking about eagles, and it's because they live in the same habitat, they need some of the same things. And matter of fact, eagles will eat a variety of food. Yep. And holding the snake is just, they hang on to you. They're snuggly. And they're not dirty. They look wet, but they're dry. Like the Mr. Clean commercial. Now, if some, of the, if some of the people who are listening to this, they'd follow your advice and go out to go hiking into the wild. Um, if they come across a mouse now or a snake in the summertime, should they pick it up? Should they pick up a wild snake or a mouse? I would say no, because everybody smile. Everybody say, they can bite. These were pet animals given to me because nobody wanted them anymore. Yeah, that's a very good question. I use a friend of mine. I didn't bring her today. Her name is called Annette. Yeah, her name is Annette. I usually bring Annette because I use it not only as a walking stick, but to capture or pick up something I want to look at closely. Wild animals, many of them will bite. Why? Because you're a giant. 
Look how big you are. You're a giant. Compared to these snakes, you're huge. Yeah. And a giant might make the little animal afraid, and they might bite as a defense. So I would say the best thing is don't pick up a wild animal. Yeah. And if you have to, I would use a net to pick it up so I could look at it. I used to work at, I will tell you this, I worked at camps where I was the nature guy, and sometimes it, you see, a scientist can see the evidence of the animal. They can see its scat where it pooped. You can, you can see its tracks in the mud or the snow. Snow is the best time to see its tracks. And a lot of times we don't see the animal because many times they're active at night. They're active at night. So sometimes I think it's important to see the live animal. And sometimes you've got to see them in captivity. Yep. But in the wild, that's a good question. I would not pick up a wild snake or a wild mouse unless I had the right tools and probably a bigger person to do it with you, a scientist, to, maybe if we're exploring something. So kids, don't do it. David, you've been, you've been sharing your experiences and sharing your knowledge for a year or two or something like that. And what is the thing that you would most want someone to use that knowledge to accomplish? Huh. Well, I think many times, uh, personally, I've been teaching since 1974. And Picasso, it's attributed to Picasso. He said something once. His goal in life is to discover his gift. And the purpose of life is to give it away. I feel that my purpose is to bring joy and give away my enthusiasm, my style of teaching to other people, to bring joy to families, to kids, adults, all ages. And I think it's important that, uh, that we go away with the idea that uh, we're part of this. We're not apart from nature. We're a part of nature. David, thank you very much for giving us that joy. And uh, thank you very much for being with us. And we hope that you come back. And thank you, Jeb. Bye, everybody. Well, thank you very much for participating in Eagle Days today. Um, we appreciate your participation. And this concludes four days of uh, Eagle Days presentations over the last two months. And um, it's been an experiment. And please let us know how we did. Uh, you're welcome to go to the Ferry Bluff Eagle Council website to Give us uh, comments on, on how you think the programming went or what we might be able to do to make it more uh, of interest for you. Our website is www.ferrybluffeaglecouncil.org and ferry, the ferry in Ferry Bluff is spelled F-E-R-R-Y. We thank our sponsors and our co-hosts without which this program simply would not be possible. It takes funds and it takes a lot of volunteer effort and it takes a lot of expertise to bring this programming to you. Our next Eagle Days is tentatively set for January 15, 2022, and we're not sure what it's gonna look like. With luck and with COVID grace, we hope that it will be some sort of mixed format of our traditional Eagle Days with in-person events but also probably some virtual events or virtualizing some of the in-person events. We'll see what it will be. And as always, we welcome your participation in whatever Eagle Days 2022 will look like. But until then, thanks for joining and go out and see some eagles. Thank you.